This morning, if you would, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, and I'd like to read verses 1 through 8. It says this, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. This morning, as we look at Isaiah's confrontation with God, there are some points that I think Isaiah realized. If you will recall not too long ago, there was a college that made the news. It was the Asbury College, where a spontaneous revival broke out. And do you remember that for several days, there was continual worship going on at the Asbury College. Years ago, I had a book that was entitled The The God Chasers. And the book was authored by a man by the name of Thomas Tinney. Thomas Tinney talked about an experience that he had when he was going to a church in Texas and they were having a revival meeting. The revival meeting had gone on for several days and um, he was in the congregation. He was seated waiting to speak and the minister got up. And if my memory is correct and I'm getting old, And they say the mind is the first thing to go. But if my memory is correct, I believe that the minister read a passage of Scripture and he said something along these lines. God no longer wants us to seek his hands. He wants us to seek his face. And when he said that, He said it was like a lightning bolt struck the pulpit. The minister collapsed and he said, suddenly you could feel literally the presence of God in the sanctuary. He said it felt literally like the air that as the presence of God filled the sanctuary, he said it felt literally like the air was being pushed out of the room. And when it felt like there was absolutely no room left, that there wasn't possibly any room left, he said the presence of God continued to fill that place. He said people found themselves face down on the ground in the sanctuary because literally the presence of God was that strong. 
they took the preacher and they took him to the office. Some of the deacons took him to the office. And Thomas Tenney said he came up and he said, literally, people started coming up to him saying, I need to be baptized. Spontaneously. And he said, I understood exactly how they felt, but it, it wasn't my church. And so he said, I sent one of the deacons to go ask the pastor if it would be okay to baptize these people. And he never came back. And he said, so I sent another guy to go um, ask the pastor if it would be okay to baptize these people. And he never came back. And he said, I sent a third guy to go ask the pastor. And, it, and finally, this guy comes back and he says, I went to go ask the pastor. And he says, when I got to the door, I saw the other guys on the ground. And he said, I was afraid to go in there. And it was a big church and they had multiple services. And he said, um, as the next service got ready to happen, nobody left. And he said, as people started coming into the building at different places, they were so overcome by the presence of God they, that some people, you know, were overcome as they came into the entryway and some people not until they came into the sanctuary, but everybody was so overcome by the presence of God and, and they came to the third service and nobody had left and people were still there. Thomas Tinney said, it ruined me for worship. He said, after that experience, he said, I don't want to do worship the way that we've done it in the past. Thus, the title of his book, The God Chasers. In Isaiah... Isaiah has one of these same kind of experiences. Isaiah is a priest, and he's working in the temple, going about his business, just like he does every day while he's working there. And suddenly, God manifested himself in the temple. And Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And he saw the angels that were with the Lord. And he saw that his presence filled the temple and smoke. The temple was filled with smoke. And he said, woe is me. For I am ruined. This morning I want to look at what Isaiah experienced. And see what Isaiah realized. The first thing is that Isaiah recognized God's awesome attributes. Isaiah recognized God's awesome attributes. Let me read those first four verses again. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Hovering around him were mighty seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with the remaining two they flew. In a great chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The glorious singing shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. The first thing that Isaiah realized is he recognized God's purity, his holiness. You know, I believe in my heart that people desire 
to experience God. We were created for fellowship with God. Adam and Eve were created for fellowship with God. And the Bible says that Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the eve. As evening would come, they actually had the opportunity to walk and to talk with God. I can't imagine what that must have been like. When Josh was growing up, he asked a million questions. Man, I, if I had the chance to, to you know, be with God, I think I would have a million questions too. Can you imagine what it would be like to walk with God and to look up into the sky and pick a star at random and know that God could tell you not only how many planets were circling that star, but what each and every one of them was like? Can you imagine what that must have been like? We were created for fellowship with God, and that's inside of us. Because that's how we were made. And I'm convinced that what people are looking for when they look for a church is not a particular order of service or a particular style of song. What people are really looking for when they come to church is to meet God. And if they find him there, they'll be back. And if they don't, They'll go someplace else. Because we are made to worship. That's how God made us. Do you remember the Asbury Revival? People came from all over the world because they wanted to be a part of that. I think that's what we should be seeking. Because it's not Dan Peterson that's going to change you and make you a better person. It's not the three songs that we sing before the communion meditation that's going to change you and make you a better person. It's not even the communion meditation that's going to change you and make you a better person. What is going to change your life is coming in contact with the creator of everything that is. And when Isaiah saw God, he was struck by his purity. And he recognized God's power. Did you notice the very first words that came out of Isaiah's mouth? It was not, man, this is awesome, right? It was not, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? It was, woe is me, for I'm undone. Because... When he was confronted with God, he saw God's holiness and he saw his righteousness in comparison. It's been a long time ago, but do you remember when I held up the sheet of paper and I asked you what color this is? And then when you said white, I held up a piece of ultra white bright paper and I said, now what color is it? You see, it's easy to convince ourselves that we're pretty righteous 
And if you compare us to the rest of the world, that would be true, right? Because there's a lot of evil in our world today. There's a lot of wickedness in our world today. If we want to make ourselves look good, all we have to do is look at somebody who's worse off than we are. And there's a whole lot of those people out there. But see, the standard is not the world. The standard that we'll be judged by is God himself. And every single one of us fall way, way short. And that brings me to my second point this morning, is that when confronted with God's presence, Isaiah recognized his own sinfulness. He recognized his own sinfulness. Isaiah 6, 5 through 7 says, Then I said, My destruction is sealed. For I am a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew over to the altar and he picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Let me remind you that Isaiah was a priest. This is not some drunk in the gutter that we're talking about here. In fact, this is a guy that God chose to use as a prophet to the rest of the nation. By our standards, we would say this guy had it together. And yet, Isaiah, when he came into God's presence, said, I'm a mess. He says, I'm a sinful man. And I'm a member of a sinful race. For I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He was struck. He was confronted with his own sinfulness. You see, I believe that there are times that we allow ourselves to deceive ourselves and think that we're pretty good people. But you see, the standard like I said before, is not the rest of the world. The standard is God. And like I sent out in, in one of my devotions at, earlier this week, God says, I want you to be holy because I am holy. I want you to be like me. You see, the book of Romans says that God has not only forgiven us of our sins through Jesus, but that he's adopted us into his family as sons and daughters. And not only has he adopted us into his family, but he's made us co-heirs with Jesus. That we get to inherit the same thing Jesus inherits. God wants his family to be like him. Have you ever seen a family and there's like no doubt that they all belong to each other? Like maybe they all have like bright red hair, you know? Or, or maybe like um, it's all like super thick and curly, um, or they all, you know, have similar characteristics or traits. And you know that they belong together. Like if somebody said, well, that's not their kid, you'd say, 
wrong, right? Because it's so obvious that they're like their mom or their dad. That's the way we're supposed to be when it comes to being his children, that we are like him because we're part of his family. We had a family years ago left the church and the reason that they gave is because they said that when they came to church, they felt guilty. You know, we should be confronted when we come to church with who we are compared to who God is. Because God is trying to make us like him. And Isaiah was confronted with his own sinfulness and not only his own sinfulness, but he recognized his own unworthiness. When he saw God for who he was, it was like, oh man, I don't even, I don't even have the right to be here. You see, it's easy for us to feel more important than we should because it's human nature. But when you see the real deal, you realize where you really stand. <clears throat> Gavin. Gavin you know, is at college, and he is doing track and football and other things, right? Albernet is a pretty small school. And it's pretty, well, for me, I came from a small school too, but, and I was never awesome, ever, right? But it's, it's not as difficult to be awesome in a tiny school, Right? Um, the only thing I could ever do in school was run track. I wasn't coordinated enough for basketball or baseball. I was too small for football. I just, the only thing I could do is run, right? And even that I was not so great at. But I did have the opportunity to run at state. And um, when we ran at state, we ran at Drake. And so, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about the fact that I get to go to state and we're this tiny rinky-dink 1A school, right? Well, at state, you don't just have 1A schools. You have 2A schools, you have 3A schools, right? And so as I'm there, I'm watching the big boys play. And it was like a whole nother level, right? It's easy to feel pretty good about myself at BCL, right? <laughs> Tiny rinky-dink school. But when you started talking about the Des Moines schools, you know, or the big Cedar Rapids schools, or the big Ames schools, you know, where they had a lot bigger pool of people to draw from, it's pretty easy to see that I was not much of a contender. It's easy for us to feel pretty good about ourselves until we see the reality of what real holiness is. And then when we see it, we realize we're not so good off as we thought we were. It's exactly what Isaiah saw. And when we come into God's presence, we're confronted with our own frailty as well. And then finally, Isaiah recognized the great privilege of serving God. In Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
Then I said, here am I, send me. Isaiah recognized the great privilege of serving God. And it is a privilege. Just think, the creator of everything that is, is giving you an opportunity to play on his team. Wow. Doesn't mean it will always be easy. It wasn't easy for Isaiah. Certainly not easy for Jeremiah. Oral tradition tells us that every single one of the apostles gave their life for their faith, save only John. And John died um, in exile on the Isle of Patmos. But the rewards will be worth it in the very end. If there's, there's an old thing that used to travel around, and um, it said, if you could receive a million dollars today, or get a penny today, and every day double it, I can't remember for how many days it was, 60 days or 90 days or something like that, which one would you take? Well, obviously, the correct answer was the second one. Well, a penny is not such a great deal, but by the time you get to the end, it becomes this ginormous sum of money that's way better than the million dollars. Living a Christian is a little bit like that. The rewards that we receive are not always today. Now, I will say this. I believe that the Christian life is the highest, happiest best life that you can have this side of heaven. I believe that. Is there no pleasure in sin? Not going to say that. If there was no pleasure in sin, nobody would do it. If every time that you sinned, you got hit with a thousand volts of electricity, you'd pretty soon figure out not to do that. Right? I'm not saying that there isn't any pleasure in sin, but what I'm saying is that sin cannot give you long-lasting uh, pleasure. I can't tell you how heartbroken I've had people in my office when they found out that their spouse has been unfaithful to them. How hurt they are. Sin can offer pleasure, but it also offers tremendous pain. But our greatest reward is not in this life. Our greatest reward is what's to come at the end. When all that has been, you know, uh, corrupted, has been set right. It's a privilege to be able to serve. So, how do we have this kind of life-changing experience? Well, first of all, you have to seek him. And I think a big part of our lives, we become so busy that we don't have time to seek him. When we pray, we're not really listening. We're simply talking to God. I've seen people who um, talk to their television set, but it doesn't do very much good, does it? Because <clears throat> it's just a one-way conversation. And ladies, there's some times that maybe you felt that way too, that there's only conversation going one direction, right? 
Um, a lot of times when we pray, we share with God what we want him to know or what we want from him, and then we're done, and we're gone, and we never, ever give him a chance to respond. Does that mean that God is going to speak to us physically in the air? Probably not. But if we are a Christian, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. It tells us that the Holy Spirit um, searches the mind of God. And that's inside of you. If you're a Christian, do you ever take time to slow down enough to try and listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you from the inside? The Bible says that God is not far from those who diligently seek him. But far too often, even when we pray, it's, dear God, you know, give us a good day, bless us food to my body, help so-and-so, thank you, amen, right? And we don't actually have any kind of two-way conversation. If God wanted to speak to us, we didn't give him a chance. Do we ever take any time just to listen? Because sometimes God speaks in the still quietness of our soul. And we're just making too much noise to hear him. Seek him. If you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. And that's what will make the difference.